Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our Wednesday night class. It's nice to see everybody. We're studying Parashat Terumah. We're making our way through the book of Exodus, uh, almost towards the end. I'd say we're, we're definitely past the halfway mark. So with, thank you, everyone, for joining us. And we are starting the parasha. We're going to learn the holy words of Reb Ayrley Payman. May his great merit be upon us. Amen. Amen. So the Pasuk tells us in this week, it speaks to us just as a, maybe just a, a minor introduction. What the Torah does now is it gave us the Ten Commandments two weeks ago. Last week it gave us more mitzvot. Then chronologically, the Jewish people actually worship the, the golden calf. But before the Torah tells us about the golden calf, which is in two more weeks from now, it's in Parshat Kitisa. Before that, the Torah tells us about the, the, the fundraising and the construction of the tabernacle, the Mishkan, which was a result and a teshuva, a form of repentance for the sin of the golden calf. So it's very interesting to note that it happens in the Torah before all of the, all of the, the, the Mishkan, the tabernacle, um, Right, that's 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 the mini portable temple base of Mikdash. All of that mandate and 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 commandment was done before the sin of the golden calf. And the reason for this is because, like God often does, He always brings the remedy before the illness. And He, re, in the Torah, we read about the remedy before the mistake that the Jewish people actually did. Having that in mind, take a look at your screen. We're in Exodus chapter 25, verse 2. This is the second verse of this week's parsha. The first pasuk is by the Bersha Moshe and the Mor, and God says to Moses, saying, Next pasuk, this is one, Daber el Bene Israel, speak to the Jewish people, Vikhuli Truma, and have them take for me a offering, an offering, Met Kolish, from every single person, Ashrid Venelibo, that would like to, that his heart is inspired, Tikhu Turumati. You shall take my offering. So this terminology of Rashi, the Midrash, other Mefarshim all jump on is Vikhudli, take for me an offering is a very odd terminology for the Torah to use. Um, how does it make any sense at all? The Mishkan, was it being built for God or for the Jewish people? Vikhudli, take for me, sounds like it's being built for God. So the truth is, Reb Leib tells us, that the Mishkan was built, Tabernacle was, was built for both. It was built on a simple level, definitely for the Jewish people. And the reason why it says, Li, Vikhuli, take for me, means Li Lishmi, as Rashi says, take for my sake, for my honor. Make sure that you're doing it all with the honor of God and, and the sake of God in mind. On a deeper level, the Midrash tells us that the Mishkan was actually built for Hashem. Why? Because Hashem can not leave the Torah. He gave the Jewish people the Torah, but he had to stay with the Torah as well. He considers the Torah, listen to what the Midrash says, this is fascinating. God considers the Torah as his own daughter, and he needs to stay connected with his daughter. So he can't expect his daughter never to move on and move along and move in with her new husband, which would be the Jewish people. But he also asks for a room, so to say, to be able to frequent by his daughter's house, to tag along, to stay with his daughter, the Torah. And this was the Mishkan. The Mishkan, according to this deep interpretation, is the place where God will reside his presence not only amongst B'nai Israel, but specifically the, with the Torah that he gave the Jewish people. And that's why it says, Vikuli, take for me in the Pasuk, a, a, an offering. Hashem's telling him, take me along. Hashem says, take me along with the Torah, just as the Torah is Hashem's daughter, like a father, take him along as well. So that's what the Midrash says, and Reblade quotes it for us. So from the above, Great novelty, two interpretations. Why was the Mishkan created for the Jewish people's sake or Hashem's sake? And the answer is both. We actually learn, Reb Leib says, a massive lesson. And we see that 
since Hashem is connected and can't be separated from the Torah, you know what the greatest way to connect to God is? Through learning His Torah. That is the apex of the ability of being able to connect to God. Now, one question Rebleib asks is, the Zohar tells us that God looked into the Torah and then created the world. Based on that, Rebleib wants to ask, if the world is a copy of the Torah, then the study of nature and science should also connect one to God. God is so connected to the Torah, but he looked into the Torah to create the world. So nature, science, the creation should all be ways, powerful ways that we should be able to connect to God. Why is that we don't see that to be true? Why don't we see scientists and archaeologists and these uh, stargazers to be the most greatest believers in, of God? On the contrary, it's very often that those type of people don't believe too much. They're, they're, they're atheists. If, this, if, if God looked into the Torah, which God's so connected to, and through learning Torah, we get so connected to God. If God looked into the Torah to create the world, why is it that through nature and the creation is not, a, is not the most powerful way as well to connect to God? And yet, there are Jews who learn Torah, and some are righteous and others may not be so righteous. But those who learn Torah have an unshakable belief in Hashem and feel very close and connected to Hashem. Why is it that when a person, I believe is asking, why is it when a person studies Torah, he connects to God greater than when they study nature and science, if nature and science is a result of God looking to the Torah to create it? So the truth is, Rebbe tells us, that David HaMelech himself wrote and alluded to these two ways to connect to Hashem, one through nature and one through Torah. In Psalm 19, which we read on Shabbat, King David starts off with seven verses of praise to God for the different aspects of creation. And then in the eighth verse, he switches to the praise of God's greatness for the Torah that he gave us. The Ibn Ezra, one of the great um, medieval Torah commentaries, he asks, what was King David doing? Why did he start with first praising God's creation, his aspect of creation of the world, and then he just flicks a switch and switches to praising God for the Torah? What does one have to do with another? So he gives two answers. Reb Sajagon says that the truth is that the creation, the way to understand this psalm of King David is that the creation is praising the Torah. That's one way. The Ibn Ezra gives another answer. And this is apropos to what we are talking about. He says there's two ways to connect to God. And no doubt about it, one is greater than the other. Both are important and even necessary, but one is much greater. There's learning Torah and fulfilling mitzvot, which is the greatest way to connect to Hashem. Studying and contemplating the creation is good too, yet it falls second to the main way to connect to Hashem, which is through studying Torah. With this, Ibn Ezra the Rebbe now says that when our sages instituted our prayer, they wrote two. They wrote for us to read two blessings before Shema, in the evening as well as in the morning. The blessings before, the first blessing that we say in the morning and in the evening is a praise for creation. Yotzer or uvar choshech. That's creation. The second praise is a praise of Torah. Ava Rabba or Avat Olam. That's a praise for the Torah that Hashem gave us. Rebbe says it makes perfect sense because right before we're accepting the yoke of God, one must connect to Hashem. If you want to accept someone's yoke, someone's reign, you have to connect to them. How are you going to connect to them? There's two different ways. Level one, that's how we say the first bracha is through creation. Level two, the higher level is through Torah. So now let's return to the Midrash about the analogy of the Torah being God's daughter that he couldn't separate from. And through analyzing that 
mashal, that anecdote, we're going to understand this concept of connecting to Hashem through these two different ways in a deeper, deeper way. One way of connecting to Hashem through Torah and the other through connecting to Hashem through creation. The question on this Midrash, and this is the main question, some of you I spoke to last night and I posed this question to, to you to draw your interest. It's a fascinating question. The question our Blabe asks is, why, does the, why is the Torah likened to Hashem's daughter and not Hashem's son? A son in general is stronger. Boys are normally stronger physically than girls. Why would the Torah be resembled to a daughter of God and not to the son of God? So Leib says the answer to this question of why the Torah resembles to Hashem's daughter lies within the found, fundamental difference between the creation of man and woman. And Reb Leib brings three different Gemaras, pieces of the Talmud, to explain this fundamental difference, one of the fundamental differences between men and women. Listen how beautiful. First is Masechet Sota, famous, famous Talmud in the beginning of the, the, the tractate. The Talmud says, 40 days before a baby is created, a heavenly voice announces, Bat ploni le ploni. The daughter of so and so is going to wed so and so. We know this. The Marsha asks an amazing question, a brilliant question. He says, Why aren't the male and female in the equation or in this announcement referred to in the same way? Meaning, it should have said the daughter of so and so with the son of so and so, or it should have said so and so and so and so. Why is it the daughter of so and so? And Mr. So and So. See how it's not it's not fair. It's either the daughter of and the son of, or it's the person themselves and the person themselves. Why is it the daughter of, and then the person itself? Second, Talmud. Second piece of Talmud that the, that Rebbe brings up. So Masechet Baba Batra, page one ten, famous Gemara. It says that before you marry a woman, you look into her brothers you go and you see the character traits of their brothers why that's what the Talmud says because the majority of one's own sons are going to be similar to the brothers of his wife or the brothers of their mother so basically your sons are going to be similar to your brother-in-laws that's what the Talmud says it seems like Rebbe asks that when a woman wants to check into her husband she can't, or it wouldn't even help her to look at her brother-in-laws or at the prospect's brothers. All she has to do is check this guy out, and based on how he behaves, his character traits, she should decide, should she marry him or not? So what's the difference? Why is it that when a man looks into a woman to see if this woman is the person he wants to marry, the litmus test can be her brother's? But his brothers can't serve as any testimony to see how he behaves or not. Third Talmud. Maybe I may be going a little quick, but you could always listen to the to the recording. Masachet Ketubot, it says as follows: that a husband who takes an oath and forbids his wife to return to visit her parents for three consecutive holidays has to pay his wife the ketuba and give her a get and set her free. Basically, divorce her. Why? Because it's too hard. It's impossible for her to keep that oath. You're basically making an oath upon someone that, that is impossible for them to keep. It's not humanly possible. Because she'll have she has this natural feeling of wanting to return to her parents' home. This is what Talmud says. So now Rev Re, Re, Re asks, why is it that we see we don't find this by a husband, that the husband has this urge to return back home to his parents? Does a man not love his parents? Oh, but only when this oath is on her, it's impossible because she can't control not going back. So again, the first one was about the, four, the announcement of the 40 days before creation of, of the child or of, 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 of a child. The next one is when you want to take a, examine a woman to see if, if she would be good for you. You go look at her brothers, why her brothers, not your brothers. And... The last one is the husband's oath on the wife that is just too hard for her to keep. Rebbe says all three of these examples 
will be answered by going back to the creation of man and woman. And then we're going to answer, why is it that the Torah is compared to Hashem's daughter? Let's take a look at our screen. Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and should cleave to his wife and they shall become one flesh. Very, very famous verse in our Torah by the creation. And from terminology in this verse, we learn that the nature of man is very unique in that when he gets married, and he builds a home for himself, he views himself as a new branch, establishing brand new roots. Even though, of course, the, the man knows that he's a product of his parents' upbringing and involvement and raising them 100%, but every man has a feeling that they want to have a new start. They want to make it on their own. Where... Does this feeling and this mentality come from? Well, it's quite simple. It comes from the fact that Adam was created from the earth. And Adam did not have a mother or father. Didn't have a human source to his creation. He was a new being. So in, he feels by nature that he needs to establish something new, break off. So the verse is hinting to this one. It says, Al ken ya'azov ish. He leaves his past behind. He separates himself from the previous generation. Now, even though the Torah says a man should leave his parents' home, and we understand that to mean a complete separation and departure, this isn't to say that a woman doesn't have to leave her parents' home as well. She should separate her, herself from them. But the difference is that the nature of a woman isn't to feel the need to separate and run away and to leave. But she still does. She still has to leave her parents' home. But Rebleib explains that when a woman leaves her parents' home, it's a partial separation. There's still some connection. There's a feeling. There's a pull towards her family. Why? Because of the way she was created. How was she created? She was created from Adam. She was created from another human being. She has a source. She has this natural feeling to be drawn back to the people of her source. So Chava's source was Adam. But every single woman's source is their parents. That's why they always feel being pulled back to their family. It's a normal and it's a natural thing. This now explains, now we're going to go back and answer our questions. This now explains why a husband cannot forbid his wife to go visit her family for an extensive amount of time because her nature to want to go back. This explains why 40 days prior to a person's creation, she's referred to as the daughter of so-and-so because she always feels connected to her parents. A man doesn't. So a man is referred to him as himself, as his own individual without his parents especially when it comes to matching up with his wife and he's now starting a new family. Now for the third one, this also explains why a woman can be checked by looking into her brother's, her brother's actions and deeds, but a man cannot be checked by looking into his brother's. Why? It's because a woman is very connected and influenced by her family. And the same way they acted at home is how she will act in her own home. The way she saw her mother raise her brothers is the way she's going to raise her own sons. So why don't we say look into the parents at that point? Because the truth is, is that the best way to know somebody is to look at their young children, especially their young boys. Because adults can put on a show. They can hide things. Kids can't hide things. Kids are the true testimony of how great a person is. It's hard to hear that, but that's the truth. This is why Rivka was so praised. Rivka, our matriarch, the wife of Yitzchak, she was the daughter of a trickster and her brother was a trickster. And King Solomon refers to her as a rose amongst thorns because she had it all set against her for success and she still succeeded. In great contrast, we look into when we look into a boy, it's sufficient to look at their traits, the way they act themselves, because 
whether they have a great sibling, a great brother, or a wicked brother, that tells us nothing about him. Why? Because a man feels like he's a new branch and he doesn't necessarily resemble anyone in his family. This explains why there was such a great contrast between twin brothers, Jacob and Esav. Same parents, same moment of birth. Each of them were independent. You think of it, most sisters are similar, but it's not so with brothers. Say most. So now that Rebele finally explained to us the difference between men and women, how men are not necessarily, necessarily connected to the previous generation, but the women still are based on their creation, now we can understand why the Torah is like Hashem's daughter and not his son. It's because the love between a father and a daughter is a two-way street. They're deeply connected. This is why Hashem asks for a place to be with the Torah. So that they can stay connected. And together, even though Hashem gave the Torah to B'nai Israel, Based on this, Reb Leib says, that's why the creation and the nature that God put into this world is still a way to connect him but it's only a second level connection you see the greatest level of connection is the torah because the torah is like hashem's daughter there's still a cre connection that's there's a connection to from the torah to hashem very strong one like a daughter to her father but he says that the nature and creation itself is like hashem's son he explains that just as a son's nature is to be independent and to break off of his parents, the same is true with the creation slash nature of the world that we live in. The world and all its wonders, Rebbe says, does give off a view that one can perceive it as, oh, this was all created on its own. It's easy to look at the world and not see God if you don't want to. Or if you want to not see God. This is why it isn't automatic to connect to Hashem through the study of nature. This is why the second tier method of connecting to Hashem is the study and the contemplation of creation and nature. The study of Torah, which is like Hashem's daughter, is the strongest connector because the Torah is deeply, deeply connected to Hashem. And the nature and creation is not as deeply connected. So I think this is a fascinating, fascinating uh, novelty, Chidush, that, that, that Reb Leib is telling us. All of this comes from the concept that we started, that Hashem considers the Torah as his daughter. And that means that God is so, so connected to the Torah. The greatest way to connect Hashem is through Torah. Hashem's, the, the creation of the world and nature is like Hashem's son. It's a way to connect to Hashem, but not like the daughter. Like Hashem Baruch Hu, bless us, that we will connect to Hashem through both of these ways, through the nature and creation of the world, and the wonders and all the creatures, but primarily through the study of Torah and understanding Torah, because that's the greatest way we'll be able to connect to Hashem, is with Hashem, Amen, Amen.